What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. To model a system, there are two main aspects that you should take into consideration, the static and the behavioral aspect. The object and class diagrams we previously covered are considered structural or static diagrams. They are great at representing the overview of the classes and objects in your application and seeing inheritance and composition. However, they are not so great at representing the lifetime of an object, the users of your system, or how these objects and users interact with each other and maybe with third-party applications. This leads us to the second aspect, behavioral diagrams. These describe how different objects change and how they communicate with one another. The two most well-known behavioral diagrams are the use case and the sequence diagrams, and we are going to cover both in this video. Use case diagrams summarize the details of your system's users, also known as actors, and their interactions with this system. It is also being said that use case diagrams are the blueprints of your system. So, using one or multiple use case diagrams, any person should be able to know what your system or application is meant to do. And using these same diagrams, any developer should be able to understand and replicate this system. Okay, suppose now that you are working on an online shopping system, and the application you are developing allows you to browse the items you are selling, purchase the items you want, of course, and also create an account on this platform. These are the use cases of our system, and are represented with a labeled oval shape. You see, you need to be a registered customer in order to make purchases. However, any customer or guest viewer can browse through the items you have to offer. Both the registered and unregistered users are considered customers of our system, aka actors of this system. Now, the different services provided by this application may require the help of third-party actors or what we call service actors. Like if a registered user made a few purchases and now wants to pay, our application could be using an out-of-the-box service provided by PayPal or credit card. Or, as another example, when a guest user wants to create an account on our platform, we may be using the authentication or login services provided by Google or Facebook. These are service actors required for our application to work. All actors of the system are represented with stick figures, but service actors, like Facebook's authentication service for example, will have on top of the stick figure a service tag on it to differentiate it from our normal actors. Finally, I'm going to draw a box around the use cases. This box represents the boundaries of my system. Anything inside the box is part of my system, and anything outside is not. So all of our actors will be outside it. In the diagram we've been drawing, you can see that we didn't dive in the details of each use case, like what are the items we are offering. And that is exactly the way to go, because you see, use case diagrams don't go into a lot of detail as written use cases do. I know the name can be a little misleading and you may think that it's a diagram of a use case, but it isn't. These diagrams almost always represent several use cases and multiple actors at the same time like the one we just had. The reason it exists is so we can get an overview of these use cases and see how they all interact in context. So it's not a replacement or substitution for the written use cases we previously saw. Instead, it is a high-level overview of the relationship between use cases, actors, and systems. Now, contrary to the use case diagram, a sequence diagram does not describe the entire system, just one particular part of it, one particular interaction between a few objects in one scenario. We start a sequence diagram with some boxes at the top that represent the objects which are the participants in this sequence. We could have two, three, or several. Beneath these, we stretch out some dotted lines. These represent lifelines, the timeline of these objects. We start by representing the messages that go between these objects at the top of this timeline or sequence. So first will be, say, a checkout message. Customer is telling the shopping cart, I want to check out. The shopping cart is going to create a new order and initiate an order object. Once that happens, we realize that the shopping cart needs to start adding the different items to this order object. These messages that we are writing can be named very simply, or they can be named with parameters, such as I'm doing here when I add an item. I know that I will need to tell the order what item it is and what quantity the customer picked. So, if I am doing solid arrows with the full head here, these are regular calls, regular messages. If I'm expecting a response, I would use a dashed arrow with a stick head. 
Now, you don't always need to write down the return messages, only when they add value. You'll also sometimes see solid boxes on the lifelines called activation boxes or method call boxes. When you see them, you can tell that some kind of processing is being done in response to the method called. In our case, the add item method. Now, if we realize that this add item message might need to happen multiple times, if we have multiple items in the cart, for example, then we can surround the calls with what we call a frame, or more commonly known as a loop, similarly to what we did for the add items and item total calls. Keep in mind that you are not trying to model this entire scenario down to the last conditional and the last iteration. That's not what sequence diagrams are for. They offer an overview of the important parts of this process and don't try to model every last if statement or while loop. Okay, so the next thing the shopping cart needs to do is calculate the total amount the customer has to pay. That's going to involve a bit of processing in the order object. That will then send the total back. And even though this might go back to the cart, we realize that effectively that's being passed all the way back to the customer who is going to be the one to submit payment. Now, we realize we don't have anything here to take care of that payment itself. So we can initiate a message from the order that's going to create a new payment object. And the only reason for this payment object to exist is to validate that payment and return a response. And then it goes off the timeline. In fact, we can indicate that by saying we will send back some results. And then we'll put in an X here to say the payments lifeline is now over. Whether that was successful or not, the object doesn't exist anymore. So order has been given results and then has to send those all the way to the customer. Now, one of the benefits of a sequence diagram is that at this level of interaction, you should be able to sit down with, say, a business user, someone who is not a developer and explain this general process. And they can hopefully give you some ideas on whether it is correct or something is missing out of it. You may create several sequence diagrams to help you understand the specific scenarios, but be aware that there is no need to try and diagram every single part of your application. You don't need to do that. These are for sketching out a situation that's not completely clear already. They will often result in you realizing that a new class needs to be created somewhere. And if that happens in this process, then that's great. So that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care and I will see you in the next one.